I had countless examples yeah. of men threatening to, in their words, correct me or fix my sexual orientation. You are coming from a place where you had to hide who you are and a part of you thinking you don't deserve that kind of liberation. How do you feel towards people who are lying in the system? It's a deliberate attempt to remove access from somebody who is a part of the community who mm-hmm. needs it. Ooh, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Queer Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Carbon. I'm Emily. And I'm Latoya. And welcome to the show. And this episode is sponsored by Busy Heart Seltzer and Field, but more on that later. What happens when the place you call home becomes too dangerous for you to stay? In today's episode, we're shedding light on the experiences of LGBTQI plus refugees and their fight to live openly and authentically. You'll hear Latoya Nugent's personal story of persecution to queer liberation. Then we'll explore the state of global LGBTQI plus persecution, the ways in which our resettlement system is failing, and then we'll close off with misconceptions and allyship. Stay with us. And our guest today is Latoya Nugent. She is Rainbow Railroad's head of engagement, activist, and a refugee who fled Jamaica with Rainbow Railroad's help. Thank you, Latoya, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. The first thing we really wanted to start out with is your refugee experience to give people a bit of an understanding of who you are. So our first question for you is if you could share what life was like for you in Jamaica as a queer person and what ultimately led you to make the decision to flee your home country and resettle here. I had a complicated experience in Jamaica because I was an activist. I was working in a space that was very homophobic, uh, transphobic, uh, but at the same time represented uh, a symbol of hope for the community. So that created conflict and complexity in my own personal life. And what it meant was a lot of the homophobic experiences I had, uh, you know, during my years as an activist, I did not speak openly about because uh, I thought that part of uh, being a beacon of hope for the community was demonstrating that despite uh, the difficulty with growing up in a place like Jamaica or just, you know, functioning in a place like Jamaica, that uh, there was still reason to be hopeful that you could find a way to carve out safe spaces uh, in what is overwhelmingly an unsafe society. While the state uh, continued uh, to be homophobic and because of its stance on uh, the LGBTQI plus community created uh, an environment where the community and even family members felt uh, as if it was uh, okay to mistreat, discriminate against, persecute LGBTQI plus people. Jamaica is also a very religious country and it's not the kind of religion that Uh, preaches and practices love acceptance uh, and so on it's uh, the kind of religion that uh, ostracizes people because uh, of who they are because uh, of who they love i as many people who had to flee have to make that difficult decision to to leave home your family people who care about you, people who love you, and even the community. You know, when I decided to make that move, I a part of me felt guilty because I believed that I was letting down the community that uh, I was working with uh, for so long. You know, I wondered what would happen to the work after mm-hmm. I left, and did leaving mean that I no longer had hope for Jamaica or the people who would continue to live there. But at the end of the day, what I recognized was I had to, at some point in my life, prioritize my own well-being. Have you visited uh, Jamaica since then? No, and I have no plans to. Do you have any family still in Jamaica? Do you still talk to them? I do. Some of the people who are closest to me are my family members, and they are all back in Jamaica. My little sister is coming to visit me next month, which I'm very very excited about. So they will visit me because I have made it very clear to them that I I would not go back to Jamaica. I don't want mm-hmm. to go back to Jamaica. I have no no mm-hmm. desire. And people will ask, so mm-hmm. but this is where you grew up. This is the place you grew up. This mm-hmm. is your family. You mm-hmm. know, your your friends are there. But uh, the thing that people tend to miss when they ask that question mm-hmm. is uh, the 
30 plus years of trauma that I would have exposed myself to mm -hmm. while I was living there. And that's one of the things I've recognized having relocated because it's after I relocated and having to look back and to process all of what I lived through for my entire adult life there because of my lesbian identity. And I keep asking myself, why did you take so long to leave? Yes, I know the answer to that question, but I still keep asking myself, mm -hmm. Why did you take so long to leave? Mm -hmm. Look at all the things you have gone through, things that I buried. But as part of the process here and as part of accessing my own healing, I saw everything that was done to me mm -hmm. and how it affected me. And there is no world where I would ever want to go back. And that is what Jamaica represents for me now. It's a site of trauma, and I don't want to return to that site of trauma. And so I am recreating what it means to find home and to belong here in Canada. And I have invited my family to come and be a part of that with me. In terms of you asking yourself why it took so long to leave, is it difficult to leave? Not just the decision to make it, but the actual process of being able to do it. So the answer to both of those questions is, yes, it is difficult. So when you hear me talk about uh, recognizing how much trauma I experienced back in Jamaica, making an asylum claim here in Canada requires you to outline every year of your life, I'd say, your experience as a, a queer person mm -hmm. living in whichever country you're coming from. Because how the asylum process works is that you have to demonstrate to the Canadian government why you had to flee your home, one. Two, why you are afraid of going back. And three, why are you depending on the Canadian government or why are you relying on the Canadian government to provide that protection for you? Depending on the Canadian government to provide that protection for you means that uh, you are separating yourself from your home country government. So in my case, it's the Jamaican government. I would no longer have uh, the protection of the Jamaican government, not that they were protecting me in the first place, but all of the rights that I would mm -hmm. typically have access to as a citizen of Jamaica, I would no longer have access to those rights, even though I wasn't afforded the same rights as mm -hmm. people who are not a part of, of the queer community. But whatever rights I was afforded, I would no longer have access to that. I am now in the hands of the Canadian government. Because you forfeit your citizenship Correct. in making that claim, right? Exactly, yeah. right. And so to do all of those things, you really have to dig deep and uh, document uh, the story of your life. There's this thing called the basis of claim that you prepare when you are submitting an asylum claim to the government. I used to hear stories about this basis of claim and that, you know, you really have to dig deep and talk about everything your entire life because it's not only about your queer identity. It's the fullness of your life and how your queer identity would have intersected with all of the different components of your life that then, you know, play, play, places you at risk. And I remember shortly after I arrived in Canada, uh, someone said to me, you have to let go of your ego when you're writing your basis of claim. You have to dig deep and go back uh, into <laughs> the depths of uh, your life and just write your story. And I recall very clearly sitting in a hotel room maybe for about nine hours or more straight, because when I was done, it was around four or five in the morning because I decided that I would just, in one sitting, write it all out. And when I was done typing it, I saw that I got to 20 plus pages and I started in my teen years because that is when I started to realize that uh, there was something that was not heterosexual right. in me. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> but when I read it, I cried mm. because it was the first time that I allowed myself to come face to face with all of what I had experienced. One of the experiences that stood out for me that I didn't talk about uh, a lot was how I became displaced when I was going to university. The, at the time we call them wardens, but they're now you know, student services development uh, managers who are responsible for the halls of residence, uh, you know, where students uh, attending university would live, asked me to leave the residence because uh, some other university students uh, living at that residence made a report that I was engaging in 
in their words, illegal activities because wow. uh, it was being quote unquote rumored at the time that I was a lesbian and I was in uh, an intimate relationship with an, another woman. And uh, according to them, they had uh, evidence uh, of this uh, and they took it uh, to the person in charge and that uh, individual asked me to leave, wanted me to leave in the middle of the semester. I don't know where I mustered the courage from. Perhaps it was just the fear of, you know, having to tell my family or not having anywhere to live. I told him that I couldn't, that I had nowhere else to go. And I begged and I pleaded and I was uh, allowed to stay for the remainder of the semester but at the end of the semester I had to go. I stopped going to classes because I just didn't want to walk on the campus. Mm -hmm. Every time I walked on the campus all of the nasty homophobic slurs that you hear you know Jamaicans utter would be hurled at me you know and I just didn't have the emotional fortitude at the time to have to live through that. I used to be very active in sports. I was on the track and field team, on the netball team and I stopped going to training. I just stayed inside my room and I would go out late at night, get food. And I was also very afraid because I hadn't told my my dad. And when I mustered the courage to tell him what was happening, I told him in a way that suggested that what people were saying about me was not true because I didn't know what the reaction would be. But I've, I found a way out with the support of another hall of residence. I got uh, access to alternate uh, housing on campus for my final year. I had to double down work, you know, two times as hard to ensure that I was able to graduate at the end of that final year. And when I was writing that uh, into my basis of claim, I didn't realize at the until then, how much that experience wounded me and how it, see, it, it affected my undergrad experience in some of the most profound ways. But I didn't deal with it. I didn't process it. I just, you know, be, because I got somewhere else to live within a surviving. few months. Yeah. yeah. You mm -hmm. know, I was doing the best uh, mm -hmm. that I could. Uh, even in my advocacy years later, I would just briefly mention that I was displaced while I was on campus because of my sexual orientation, but never spoke about uh, how that affected me and how I I started to access uh, healing at this new hall of residence that was uh, a residence of just women and, you know, having the loud slurs, homophobic slurs, almost converting to whispers, which was more tolerable. Mm -hmm. And I could go to classes again and, you know, I eventually graduated. Uh, I, I survived. And that was just one example. I had countless examples yeah. of men threatening to, in their words, correct me or fix my sexual orientation, you know. But the, the final thing that led to me deciding that I had to leave was uh, years after being arrested for my activism, I went to a conference in Barbados. It was a, a conference for women, you know, gender non-conforming or non-binary people. There was a panel on immigration, asylum, and uh, queer and trans refugees. Someone from Rainbow Railroad was at uh, that event, and they were speaking on that panel. I was doing some work with queer women uh, at the same university at, at the time. One of the challenges that a lot of queer women going to university experience now is uh, even though there are programs that try to create safe spaces for them when they go out into the wild wider Jamaican community, especially in the context of work, it's extremely difficult. And some people, you know, make the decision to, to, to migrate because of that. So I was talking with her about potentially establishing some kind of partnership between Rainbow Railroad and uh, the residents that I was working with at the time. It's so interesting. The same residents mm. that took me in maybe... 20 years ago, I'd say, 20 mm -hmm. plus years ago, I ended up working for that residence mm -hmm. later in life. But then before we wrapped up, wrapped up the conversation, she said something to me. She said, I know you're not asking me for these young women 
you need to ask me for yourself. She was saying to me, you may not know me, but uh, I've been following your work and the person that I oh. see at this conference is just a shell of the Latoya that I know. So you need this for yourself too. But think about it. I went back to Jamaica and uh, I kept thinking about that conversation and I wanted to learn more about the process how could I actually relocate what it would involve and then she outlined all of what would be required and in my mind I was saying whoa that's that's a lot yeah. it's it's a lot but then the other thought which came swiftly was this is the universe's way of saying you have to go part of what uh, I've come to learn about the asylum process is you have to investigate your own life to prove to the government, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. that you deserve protection, that mm -hmm. you deserve to live with dignity, that you deserve to have a home, that you deserve to feel like you belong, that you deserve to be safe. Mm -hmm. Although it's been difficult, it's worth it. I tell people all the time, it's the best decision I've mm. ever made. And the only regret I have is that I did not make that decision much earlier in my life. I find it really incredible that you even continued in your undergrad after yeah. all of that humiliation, ridicule. I remember when I came out and it was just to my parents and I was, I was doing my undergrad when I did that and I completely failed everything after that. And I didn't continue. Part of that had to do because I realized I didn't like what I was studying and I didn't like the, the path that my life was uh, going down and had to be truthful to myself. But just that experience alone was enough for me to completely break down and to not continue studying. I can't imagine also having the ridicule from all of your peers and rumors and threats to your life at school, I wasn't in any sort of physical danger from other people. So that's really quite brave, miraculous, incredible that you were able to do that. One thing I'm curious about is if you can kind of outline like what the laws are in Jamaica around queerness and then also how activist work is able to exist within that as well. There are no laws that say you can't be mm. LGBTQI+. Mm -hmm. What we have are laws that outlaw same-sex intimacy. We have a constitution that uh, defines marriage in a particular way. It's exclusively a male person cohabiting for five plus consecutive years or legally married to a female person. Because of how marriage is defined, the ways that uh, people may be protected if they are married to an opposite sex uh, partner, mm -hmm. they are not protected in the same ways if they are in a domestic same-sex partnership. If you have uh, an opposite sex partner, you can get compassionate leave if they, if your partner is ill. You mm -hmm. don't have access to that if you're in a, you know, same-sex uh, um, relationship. So there are many of those kinds of examples. Yeah. Folks not being explicitly outlawed, yeah. but because uh, same-sex behavior is outlawed yeah. and because uh, the constitution defines marriage the way that it does, then you don't have access to the same kinds of mm. rights. And mm. what that does is it creates uh, a community that uh, feels empowered to discriminate against uh, mm. queer people the, in the mm. ways that they do, including employers or, you know, school administrators or people in your own family. It doesn't prevent people from doing the work of activism right. and we also don't have uh, any law that bans uh, queer propaganda or you know mm -hmm. activism in that kind of way so people are able to do the work mm -hmm. but at the same time doing the work makes many people a target this next section that we want to jump into is really around the resettlement process here in canada and its pitfalls in what ways does the canadian asylum process fail queer and trans refugees and what reforms do you believe are urgently needed queer and trans refugees can access asylum in canada in more than one way the mm. way i accessed uh, 
the system was to make what's called an inland claim. So I got to Canada and then I made a claim. Mm-hmm. There are some individuals who submit a claim before mm-hmm. arriving to Canada and their claim is processed overseas. Uh, one thing is common though, regardless of the pathway that uh, someone relocates through. Many people who work in immigration may not say this explicitly, but in a lot of ways you have to prove something that's very intimate and personal to you. That's perhaps the number one way that the asylum process fails uh, queer and trans refugees. The reality is if there's a war happening or if there's some climate disaster happening anywhere in the globe and queer and trans people are displaced and need to seek refuge in a country like Canada, Mm -hmm. they don't have to prove that because it's known. Mm -hmm. If you're making a claim because you're being persecuted uh, and discriminated against uh, because uh, of your sexual orientation or gender identity, that's very personal and oftentimes private. But if you don't prove that uh, you are at risk uh, or your life uh, is uh, in danger because uh, of this uh, identity, then it is likely that you will be sent back to the country where you are fleeing, that you're trying to flee from. That is where I think we need reform because governments like Canada are fully aware of the circumstances and the realities uh, that uh, LGBTQI plus people face in countries like Jamaica or Uganda or Ghana. The legislative framework and the cultural attitudes uh, of people in that society make it dangerous for LGBTQI plus people to live. Uh, Some people are not able to even access the the pathway that I was able to access because they don't have any quote-unquote evidence Mm -hmm. to prove that they have been persecuted because of their sexual orientation. One Mm -hmm. of the things that helped me was because I was out in Jamaica. I was Mm -hmm. doing the work and a lot of what, uh, you know, I I was doing was public knowledge. But that shouldn't be what uh, is required because we have people coming from countries where, on the one hand, we're asking people to, to, to submit letters of support from family members or colleagues Mm -hmm. or people who do activist work to say this is somebody who is a part of the community and maybe they've been doing this kind of work and so on. But at the same time, they're living in countries where they're terrified. Mm -hmm. That would put them in more danger. Yeah, they're terrified of sharing that information with anybody, even the people who may be closest to them. It's almost as if we put people at risk Mm -hmm in order to support their relocation journey. Yeah. I'm guessing the reason they do this is to, I guess, try to keep people from lying who aren't queer. How big of a problem do you think that is, like people lying? But before we get into that, this podcast is proudly sponsored by Vizzy Heart Seltzer. And with Vizzy's vibrant flavors, you can now follow your own vibe. For those of you who know Queer Collective, you know that Vizzy has been a longtime supporter of us and our mission to create accurate and positive representation for the entire queer community. So if you are a hard seltzer drinker, we highly recommend drinking and supporting one that you know also supports the queer community. These past seven months, we've been having a really incredible time exploring ethical non-monogamy in our own relationship because we're dating. And a huge catalyst for this change has genuinely been exploring things on Field. For those of you who don't know, Field is a dating app geared towards polyamory, ethical non-monogamy, and kink. If this sounds like something you're interested in exploring, we definitely recommend downloading Field. That's F-E-E-L-D. And now, back to the episode. So there have been uh, stories written about people who've admittedly, you know, Mm -hmm. um, shared that uh, they will lie about their sexual orientation because in Mm -hmm. their minds, creating a narrative around uh, being persecuted because of their sexual orientation or gender identity will be helpful Mm -hmm. for them. But what that does for every single case, we haven't gotten reports of a lot of those cases, but for every single case like that, Mm -hmm. that becomes known, it may makes it uh, 10 times as difficult for people who are at risk Mm -hmm. because of their sexual orientation and gender identity Mm -hmm. to access the relocation or the resettlement pathway. It's unfortunate. And uh, 
in a lot of ways, I see it uh, as uh, another way for people who have hatred towards the community to deny the community access uh, mm. to a, a life-saving pathway. Because yeah. the, the more the more that happens, the more you leave at-risk people in danger in their home countries because mm. uh, the system will start by disbelieving people. That's a part of the issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The system starts by disbelieving people. And because they start by disbelieving people, they create all of these additional barriers that people have to jump so that they can access uh, the resettlement pathway that they need in order to, to save their own lives. I wonder if it, if it even works to deter people because, one, it's definitely re-traumatizing people by having to make you recount all of this, definitely without the support of any kind of therapist or anything like that. You're Like you said, you're writing this all down by yourself and then dealing with those feelings probably afterwards all by yourself. If, like you're saying, a lot of folks don't have access to evidence of these kinds of things, they're just writing their own personal accounts, what's keeping some other people from just writing their own personal accounts of, mm -hmm. of fake things that may have happened to them. Do you think that this is doing anything to deter anybody? I don't think it's deterring people because the reality is when uh, when someone reaches out to Rainbow Railroad, I can almost guarantee you that we are their last option. They mm -hmm. would have tried everything else. Mm -hmm. They would have tried to cope. They would have tried to access all the possible support and services that they can mm -hmm. access in their home country or in mm -hmm. their local community. Usually by the time folks get to us, they have no idea what else to do, where else to turn, and uh, they've given up hope. Even after people learn about what the process mm -hmm. requires, they, they do it. For a lot of people, it really is a matter of uh, survival and they just need to get out uh, and this is a way for them to to get out and uh, whatever the system requires mm -hmm. folks to do they do it so that they can actually leave and feel hopeful about yeah. what's on the other side how do you feel kind of on a personal level towards people who are lying in the system i would say it's unfortunate yeah and uh, to remind folks that uh, they are putting the lives of queer and trans people at mm -hmm. risk. Being queer and trans uh, is perhaps the, the most difficult, uh, I would say, group mm -hmm. of people who get the privilege of mm -hmm. accessing asylum. It's already difficult yeah. when people are creating false narratives uh, mm. about uh, queer identities. Uh, in order to access that, they mm -hmm. really are just making the process uh, 10 times difficult mm -hmm. um, for people who are actually queer and trans. It's a different kind of homophobia and, and transphobia, if you think about mm -hmm. it, because it's a deliberate attempt uh, to remove access from somebody who is a part of the community who mm -hmm. needs it. Because we all know that governments have their caps, you yeah. know, their numbers uh, that they bring in for the year. And, and so if, if people are being mm -hmm. denied mm -hmm. a pathway because someone else is creating false narratives uh, about needing that pathway, then, you know, mm -hmm. what, what they're really doing is, is shutting people out, people mm -hmm. who are in danger yeah. in their home country. If some people are making false narratives to seek asylum under that pathway specifically, I'm wondering what went into making that decision. Are they just a bad person? Did they have no other options? Are they running from something else that is really difficult, but it isn't that? What could have possibly made somebody make that decision? And why was another pathway maybe not available to them? Part of the reason I take offense to, you know, folks uh, doing that is because there are other pathways. Mm -hmm. There are pathways available for people who are at risk in their home countries for different, a myriad of reasons. Every time I hear about one of these uh, kinds of stories, you usually find out that the person is homophobic and oh, transphobic. That's, that's part of it. And the other part is uh, sometimes uh, it's for purely economic reasons. Yeah. So it's not another kind of hardship. If 
this pathway of seeking asylum specifically for queer and trans people and having to go through the process of proving everything is one of the most difficult processes, then why even choose that process if there's other pathways that might be potentially easier? The thing is, I feel like it's a very traumatizing experience for someone who is actually queer because right. you are bringing up your own lived experiences. But if you're just writing down yeah. things right. that you didn't actually experience, then it's not yeah. actually that difficult. You know, That's like fair. you're not speaking mm -hmm. about your own lived experience. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. The, the trauma... Is not living in your body no, the same right. way. It's a different experience yeah. from somebody who, who actually had to live it. This kind of ties into my next question. To offset our aging population and decreasing birth rates, Canada has one of the highest annual immigration rates of any country in the world, many which are coming from countries that do persecute LGBTQ plus individuals. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or concerns around folks immigrating here who hold homophobic and transphobic beliefs. One of the things that some folks who relocate or are about to relocate will say to us is they do not want to be connected to anybody from their diasporic community mm -hmm. you know so somebody coming from nigeria will say i don't want to meet anybody from nigeria because they associate that uh, with homophobia yep. and, and transphobia significant majority of the people who relocate through you know different uh, pathways uh, are folks who are considered uh, ec economic migrants even though people coming from some communities will carry the same kind of uh, homophobic and transphobic attitudes or behaviors with them. But I don't think we can prevent people from relocating if they have these homophobic uh, yeah. attitudes. Perhaps where I have some hope, it's in the culture here. Where people live uh, in uh, communities here in Canada, I find that uh, they tend uh, to adapt uh, the Canadian culture, let's call it that, mm -hmm. uh, around how we treat people from the LGBTQI plus community. So I think in that way, I still feel very hopeful about the kind of environment and communities that uh, um, LGBTQI plus refugees uh, would live in, mm -hmm. because I know there is a, a natural instinct for people to try to stay away from their diaspora communities, mm -hmm. unless they know that this is their queer yeah. diaspora community. Speaking of folks not wanting to be connected with their own cultural communities when they come here. I know that's how a lot of new immigrants and refugees find, I guess, like comfort and community. And I'm wondering kind of what finding community looks like for new queer refugees and how it feels for them to, I guess, like connect with the queer community, which might feel very much like a culture shock. Usually when people relocate for humanitarian protection reasons, they are relocating as a family. Mm -hmm. But for many queer and trans refugees, they are relocating alone. In a few instances, they may be relocating with a partner. And in even fewer instances, they're relocating with a child. So that's the first thing. A lot of people are alone. They're on their own. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are also relocating to countries where they don't have uh, any connections. And how people find connection is through the programs that are offered by organizations doing uh, the post-resettlement work. And what I've noticed that a lot of these organizations do is they create space and programming specifically for LGBTQI plus refugees mm -hmm. because they also recognize that the wider resettlement system does not offer that kind of support mm -hmm. to queer and trans refugees. Refugees, just as a broad category, the way that... Uh, you know, support is provided for them to integrate into Canadian society is usually around, uh, you know, the basics, housing, mm. uh, accessing English language, if that's not your language, or French, uh, education, uh, not so much uh, the thing you're looking for as a queer and trans refugee, mm. which is finding community. That is the thing that people are looking for the most because uh, where they're coming from, they didn't have that uh, in the same way. And even though you're coming from a country where you weren't allowed to 
to be who you are, to love who you want, you will come to Canada and you will see people doing that and it will still shock you even though that's the thing you mm. aspire to for yourself mm -hmm. you see it and you see it in all its glory especially if you come you know in may or june when everybody's <laughs> out and about and that uh, sometimes uh, results in a weird kind of uh, internalized homophobia because you see it and it's everywhere but you are coming from a place where you had to hide who you are and a part of you thinking you don't deserve that kind of liberation mm -hmm. and when you see people living that uh, every mm -hmm. single day it yeah it, it shocks you you know and it, it takes a while for you to feel comfortable because you're also carrying the trauma mm -hmm. of where you're coming from thinking that uh, you may be putting yourself in danger if uh, you embrace this newfound liberation and one of the things that work is when you are in community with people who are having relatively similar experiences as you mm -hmm. so if you are connecting with people who relocated uh, you know, last year or a few months ago before you got here, you can learn from their experiences. You can mm -hmm. understand and prepare yourself for the challenges yeah. that are ahead because there will be challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, that is something I found helped me a lot. There's somebody who relocated through a similar pathway several years before me and we really connected and they gave me a lot of tips mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it, it helped me a lot in those first six months to a year. The newcomer, you know, queer refugee community just banding. I, I think that is something that can be very helpful. And a lot of the organizations doing queer resettlement work try mm -hmm. to create space uh, for that. Folks also have to navigate uh, their their identity because a lot of folks are coming from countries where they were not racialized but in Canada yeah. they're yeah. racialized yeah. and uh, their their racial identity becomes uh, more prominent or more important in their everyday existence in ways that it was not uh, an overwhelming majority of uh, queer refugees are racialized people. A good friend of ours who uh, did come here as a, a queer refugee, but without the help of an organization like Rainbow Railroad, mm -hmm. so kind of tried to place themselves in the middle of the Canadian queer community without having kind of like the queer refugee community to ground them. And one experience that they found and was sharing with us is just feeling like the type of queer liberation wasn't accessible to them in their body, like being able to dress feminine in a very like hairy, masculine looking body wasn't celebrated the same way as like a, a white person was who was a hairless person, for example, like these different layers made them feel very othered. My experience coming out as queer as a person of color is very different than somebody who specifically comes here as a queer refugee. Um, and that already is something that I have privilege in. Even with that privilege, I still feel distant or othered from my cultural background. Every time that I even think about visiting Colombia again, I think all these mini calculations go through my head of like, well, can I wear what I want? Is my hair going to give me away? Is my mannerisms going to give me away? Is that going to put me in danger to the point where I just haven't gone back for a while? Basically, since I've sort of altered my appearance in terms of me feeling more comfortable in my masculinity. So I look very obviously queer now. And since looking obviously queer, it, it makes me feel sort of afraid to go back because I don't entirely know what the status is there and how people are treated there. I know that from when I left, it wasn't good. That has now translated to even while being here, me feeling apprehensive about being a queer person in front of another Latino person. So when I walk into like a Colombian store for food, sometimes I don't even speak Spanish to them. And I'm like, I hope that you don't realize that I'm also Colombian because I don't want you to judge me. I recently started to cut my hair and I got the recommendation from somebody who is queer and Jamaican. And because I got the recommendation from somebody who's queer and Jamaican, you know, I just figured this is a, a queer space. But when I went the first time, I was just listening to the conversations. In my head, I was saying, 
oh my goodness me, I don't think this is a queer space. But then the barber was so good. I said to myself, okay, so maybe what you do is you don't come as often as you are planning to and you just don't engage in conversation with people because there's a cultural experience about being in a barbershop or in a salon in Jamaica that if you chose the wrong one, you would expose yourself to a lot of homophobia, misogyny. Just Even if it's not targeted at you, mm-hmm. you hear it. Fortunately, so far, I haven't had any kind of uh, negative experiences, but it's that fear. I don't think you can ever get rid of that. And I think it's because the trauma is so deep rooted or deep-seated in your experiences, whether your personal experiences or your knowledge of Mm -hmm. what the situation is in a particular country. The next section that we want to get into is just some insights about the state of global LGBTQI plus persecution. What trends or data from the latest global LGBTQ plus persecution report stand out as most alarming or pressing? The first alarming piece is uh, that I want to mention is something that's actually not in the report. Mm -hmm. Rainbow Railroad is the only organization that publishes this kind of report. Mm -hmm. The other thing we noticed last year was uh, we were hitting record numbers for requests for help. Mm -hmm. For context, uh, four or five years ago, we were receiving 3,000 or less. Mm -hmm. In 2021, it was a little over 8,000. In 2022, it moved to 10,000. And in 2022, that shocked the organization. But then last year, we noticed that that number below to 15,352 requests for help coming from several countries, not just countries uh, where LGBTQI plus people exist in criminalized contexts. Mm -hmm. The other piece that uh, surprised us was the fact that the U.S. continued to emerge as one of those top 10 countries where mm. people are oh, requesting wow. help from. When we check the, the 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 narrative in a lot of the requests, a lot yeah. of it was uh, related to what we, we've been noticing in many states that uh, are criminalizing trans people. You know, they're mm. passing state laws that criminalize trans people. A lot of folks uh, following the Roe v. Wade Mm -hmm. reversal in 2022, you know, became really nervous about what that meant for the community. And so a lot, many people were reaching out to us for support to to help them to either relocate to another state within the U.S. or to relocate to Canada. Would you say this changing legal landscape in the United States is the main cause for this like balloon in, in numbers yes, of requests? Yes, from the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's a very interesting and complex uh, place to work because the U.S. still remains one of the top countries where refugees want to flee to. So it is at the same time a country of reset, resettlement yeah. and also a country where, you know, a country that's popping up in our top 10 list. So that has been, you know, a very uh, unique uh, situation for that because we haven't noticed that with with mm-hmm. any other country and the US being in the top 10 is also a relatively new you know phenomenon the challenge that we find and and this happened in 2023 is whenever there is any move by a particular government to attack uh, the community or outlaw or further outlaw, you know, the community, we always see spikes in requests Mm. for help. So I don't know if you remember, but last year around May, you know, in Uganda, the Anti-Homosexuality Act, the bill was, was passed into law. And that created widespread panic uh, among queer folks, Mm. including queer activists in Uganda. And young people tend to be disproportionately affected by those incidents uh, Mm. because they are usually more dependent on their family. Another thing I wanted to address before moving on to the next section is kind of a lack of access to resources for new queer refugees. A good friend of ours was sharing that when you're first moving here, there's definitely significant barriers to accessing resources such as healthcare, housing, and legal support. 
and sharing that themselves did not have a credit score as many new refugees do and weren't able to get themselves a home. And then the expectation for them was to live in a shelter, which has really long wait times or be able to afford a hotel or Airbnb for themselves until you're able to build up your credit. And then on top of that, they weren't able to access a work work permit for the first four to five months. And you have this expectation to be able to sustain yourself. Of course, this leaves a lot of room for people to be mistreated by employers uh, if they're working under the table jobs and they also mentioned they were working like a seven dollars an hour job for the first few months just because they didn't have any other options so I'm wondering if you think that going through kind of an avenue like Rainbow Railroad helps avoid situations like this or if you think this is just kind of the common experience and one of like her big pitfalls it is a common experience and going through an organization like Rainbow Railroad would not prevent all of that yeah but it would cushion some of the blows Mm -hmm. you mentioned four months plus to get a work permit it is because if you're making an inland claim you're Mm -hmm. only able to apply for your work permit when you are making that claim and then Mm -hmm. you know there has to be some preliminary interviews that are done Mm -hmm. to ensure that you have a credible enough case to advance Mm -hmm. and and once that is done you would then uh, get your your work permit and and that takes uh, some months queer refugees are also disproportionately affected by homelessness again yeah there isn't a network that you have mm-hmm. here you, you you know there's no family no yeah. friends and so on and so the reality is a lot of folks uh, would have to spend uh, you know the first few months either in a mm-hmm. hotel or airbnb or shelter or a combination which uh, which can be you know very difficult mm-hmm. All also, folks who make inland claims, uh, they have less uh, access to social services support than uh, folks who relocate through the government assisted refugees program because the government uh, subsidizes their livelihood expenses on mm. a monthly basis by much, at a much higher rate than folks making inland claims. The resettlement uh, organizations that work with folks to help them to access uh, all of the services that they need, they are also overrun. They are mm-hmm. beyond capacity, which leads to, you know, what your friend mentioned, the long wait list. And so it, it begs the question, you know, what uh, more do provincial or federal governments need to do? I know that there has been a lot of advocacy around the work permit piece, because if people are able to access uh, their work permit early, yeah. then they could potentially secure better paying jobs uh, earlier in the process, uh, which means that uh, it would fix a lot. And I know that, you know, there's quite a bit of uh, advocacy advocacy happening around that. Uh, I know that the wait time used to be much longer. Mm -hmm. They've cut it down to a a few months and there is still more work happening to cut that down even further. Mm -hmm. There's also an economic reason for the government to do that too because it means it would be less people who would be depending on the minimal uh, social welfare that they you provide to to individuals. And so yeah, it is it is a bit of a challenge and while, you know, an organization like Rainbow Railroad could, you know, try to cushion some of that blow, it's mm. still it's still not enough. Internally, we are working on ways that we can mobilize the community and galvanize more support uh, for folks who make inland claims because we realize that uh, the organizations doing the post-relocation work, uh, they are beyond capacity because there's so many more people than resources available. And the only way I see that changing is if we can get the community mm-hmm. to actually rally around folks and uh, provide that kind of extended family support. In your opinion, what can the queer community do to help queer refugees and in their settlement? The most immediate thing I would say is providing social support to folks after they arrive. Access to IDs or healthcare, you know, completing forms or just understanding how things work. Understanding the financial system because a lot of queer and trans refugees are fleeing from countries that have very, very different uh, financial systems and structures. Uh, Some people have never owned uh, a credit card Mm. before. People in the queer community who understand uh, 
uh, just the different ways that mm. we do things uh, that can be very helpful for an individual, you know, from day one, knowing that you have uh, people in your corner supporting you, people you can count on for advice or people who can connect you to their networks or to take you to an event yeah. so you can meet more queer people. I, I think if people have more of that from the get go, mm -hmm. they won't feel so alone and uh, the process won't feel mm -hmm. as difficult. Rainbow Railroad is one of the partnering organizations on this Refugee Housing Canada program. And what they're trying to do is uh, to get uh, Canadians involved in uh, providing uh, shelter or homes for queer mm -hmm. and trans refugees. You know, so people who may have a spare bedroom or if they have uh, an apartment uh, that they can rent at below market rates mm -hmm. to refugees, on, you know, even in the short term until they are able to secure more long term or permanent housing. That is a way that people can, can get involved. So what and do people look up to kind of get on that list to, to help connect themselves to somebody? We have a volunteer program mm -hmm. and one of the things we are trying to build out, uh, we started it uh, in the U.S., is what we call these communities of care, where we mobilize volunteers who are committed to assisting refugees for a short while just to help them to get on their feet, mm -hmm. really. That's easy for folks to sign up for. Just go to our website, rainbowrailroad.org slash volunteer, and there's a way for individuals to sign up. And in signing up, you can also tell us uh, what skills you have that you think you could utilize to, to help someone out. Yeah, absolutely. Community and support systems are so critical, especially when you're restarting your life like that. That's why we see so many new immigrant communities all grouping mm -hmm. together. So we would definitely encourage our listeners to to go and sign up and volunteer to help out. On to our next question. I'm wondering if there's some common misconceptions or stereotypes about queer refugees that you frequently encounter and how we could debunk those. The one I hear people talk about the most is uh, refugees uh, are a security threat. Mm. And this is usually steeped in, you know, anti-immigration narratives, uh, mm. a little bit of xenophobia here and there, and sometimes just outright, you know, racist. Because what I find is uh, comments around uh, threats to security are often made in reference to racialized refugees. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't understand exactly what queer and trans refugees are being forced to mm. flee. And that is a big part of what I believe creates the misconception. People who find themselves in a position where they become a refugee, it's something that f that's forced on them. It's not mm. uh, something that people choose. They're not a, a security risk. Mm. The other misconception is that refugees who are creating strains on things like housing and yeah. mm. uh, em employment rates and so on, and again, that is also mm. not true. Access to housing that uh, queer and uh, trans refugees mm. uh, would have or could have is available. Yeah. That's the reality. It's available. Refugee Housing Canada did quite a bit uh, of research when they decided to come up with this project of mm. trying to get more Canadians to you know, open their homes to refugees. That There were mm. millions of empty bedrooms Right oh, here wow. in the GTA. So this yeah. idea that uh, refugees represent a sort of strain mm. on the economy is it's not true. And mm -hmm. it, I mean, you, you can check the CRA data too. Refugees uh, have the best tax compliance rate in Canada. Mm. It's over 90%. People are coming here because one, they were forced to, but when they come here, they, they, they want to work hard. They want to contribute. Yeah. They want to, you know, recreate home and they want to find community. They're not seeking to, to relocate uh, so that they can just, you know, sit around and uh, accept mm. handouts from, from, from the government or, you know, anything like that. They, they want to make significant contributions here and they have been making yeah. those contributions. Uh, yeah. And, and like I said earlier, too, on an economic level, we actually need refugees and immigrants in this country. There's a reason our government has set such a huge quota is because in order to keep 
keep our economy going and successfully going, you actually need more people entering the workforce, which we don't have here organically in Canada. I mean, all the refugees that I've ever known, including my own family, has never demonstrated that ever in their lives. And they're some of the most hardworking people that I've ever seen. I can understand where some people come from. And we are in a housing crisis. You know, the cost of living in Canada is very high. It's challenging to live here right now. But that isn't because of refugees or immigrants by any means. It's because of greater systems at hand. And also, I would even argue because of like foreign and the corporate ownership of housing in Canada, that many people aren't able to access like affordable housing. So I think it's easy. And I think it's kind of like a fear mongering mindset to say, that the reason that you aren't able to get what you need here is because of these people coming and taking your resources. I think a lot of politicians particularly would like you to stay scared and would like to point a finger and create a common enemy. That's everything that we have for you today. And if you want to dive deeper into the queer Muslim experience and what that's like as a refugee, we have a whole episode on it with our guest Bilal. It'll be the video on the left. Make sure to subscribe and like the video. And if you're listening on your favorite your podcast app make sure to leave us a five-star review because it really does help the podcast out that's everything that we got and until next time peace, peace.